Welcome back, everybody, to the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com. Once again, we are coming to you live from the PMI 2016 Global Congress in sunny San Diego, California. And with me this afternoon is Cindy Snyder Dionisio. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Cornelius. Congratulations, you're Pimbox 6 chair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, no more like congratulations, <laughs> you've handed it off, it's done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let me ask you the obvious question. Why did you choose to take on this enormous task of bringing out the next Pimbox guide? So people... Anybody who studied motivation theory knows there's different motivators, right? And so there's one theory that says um, people are motivated by accomplishment and achievement. I am motivated by accomplishment and achievement. I wanted, I've done it before. I want to do it bigger. I want to do it better. I, and I love working with the team I got to use. I worked with an international team of people from Israel and Australia and Spain and Canada and Great Britain. And it was just, oh, it was just the best ever Okay. And when you say you have done it before, you did it for the fifth edition, is it? Fourth. That? Fourth edition. Fourth edition. So you skipped one. Okay. Dave Violet got that one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. So the obvious question is, why is there a sixth edition coming out? <laughs> was the fifth edition not good enough? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It was wrong. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. So there's a standard, and a, a standard is... An ANSI standard, we have to also... uh, Yeah, American National Standards Institute. And that requires that you look at and update or review the standard every five years. So it was time to do that. So part of it was ANSI compliance. The other part is our our progression, our profession is progressing. And so there are new practices that are showing up, like Agile. Agile is starting to show up more and more. It's part of our continuum of practice. And so... We feel it's important to update the guide so it's more reflective of what is happening today. And then, you know, I always tell my team, really, what are we here for? We're here to change the world. Change happens through projects. If we can help improve the way people do projects, we can help improve the way the world works. Excellent. How many people were on your team? You mentioned there was an international team. Mm -hmm. How big was it? So my core team was about 10 people, varied. Mm -hmm. We had some people come and leave during the thing. And then... Um, Each core team member led a chapter, and each chapter or section, if you will, knowledge area had three to five people. So we ranged from, I mean, the the core committee did most of the work, but we also had like maybe 20 subject matter experts that reviewed their part of the team. The MAG reviewed their part of the team. Maybe 40 to 50 people helped contribute content, so they're part of the team. So it's a big team. All right. Let's move on to the guide itself. And there's something that many people probably don't realize when they hold the printed copy in their hands. They're actually holding two things. They're holding the standard and they're holding the PMBOK guide. Could you help them explain that? Yeah, so the standard is the ANSI national standard. In the fifth edition, if you open it, there's the annex. And it's called a standard of project management for managing a project or something, something like that. Something along those lines. Yeah, really. Yes. Something it's, it's the section that nobody actually reads. That's almost. right. Yeah. That's right. It's inputs and outputs in a, yeah. in a description of the process. So that's the standard. It has to be updated. Well, once you update the processes and the inputs and outputs, then you got to update the guide, which is what everybody thinks the standard is, right? And that's what we call the ITTOs, inputs, tools, techniques, and outputs, and, and the first three chapters. Okay. There was simplification going on inside of the standard, in particular in the ITTO tables. Mm -hmm. And it was said that it was simplified for stability. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Yeah. Awesome question. So in the fifth edition and the fourth edition, all the previous ones, we'd have inputs. We'd have the schedule management plan, cost management plan, uh, communication management plan, risk management plan. Those are all inputs to a process. So we just said, hey, project management plan's an input. And (laughs) <laughs> These subsidiary plans are all part of the project management plan. Therefore, you don't need to mention them individually. That's right. And we're really trying to emphasize that you should tailor what's needed. So for my project management plan, I had a volunteer engagement plan. Most projects don't have that. They might have a safety plan in construction. So I'm trying to get people to engage their critical thinking to say, I don't need a schedule management plan if I don't need a schedule management plan. I need a project management plan, and it should have the components I need to manage this project. 
So let's just make it simple. Your PM plan is an input. And project documents are an input. They're separate. And we're going to list some examples. For example, a project document might be your requirements. It might be your risk register. It might be your stakeholder register. But you should determine what you need as an input. All right. You mentioned tailoring. Mm -hmm. And I understand tailoring within the PMBOK guide is going to be included nearly in every one of the knowledge areas, Mm -hmm. explaining how you should be tailoring that. Why did you put that in there? Um, So sort of, again, just we can't just say you should tailor this and then expect people to all of a sudden know how they should tailor it. So at the front of every knowledge area chapter, we'll have a subsection called tailoring. And we have some questions that people should look at to say, hey, is your environment more adaptive or predictive? Do you have a matrix organization or do you have a projectized organization? Are the requirements for this project stable or are they still evolving? And based on the answers to those questions, you might have different, uh, a different project life cycle. You might have different inputs. You might have different tools and techniques. So we're giving people some questions to look at prior to looking at a knowledge area or a series of processes to say, how can I select the best project documents or the best way to approach this for my individual project? Mm-hmm. So it's becoming much more of a pick-and-choose-your-own kind of an approach. Pick-and-choose what makes sense for your project, not just because the PMBOK guide said. I, w- I, would, I think people think that the PMBOK guide is the Bible of project management, and it's not. It's a guide. It's a guide, 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 guide. Mm. <laughs> yes. I think one of the big things that people want to know is when we switched from the fourth edition to the fifth edition, oh, look, a new knowledge area, stakeholder management. Any big, big changes like that in the sixth edition? So there's no new knowledge areas. Yay, Yay. everybody's cheering. (laughs) No new process groups. Yay, uh, everybody's cheering. Was it process? Yeah, Yeah, it's process groups, yes. (laughs) No, my goodness. Three new processes and one went away. So we're now at... 49. 49. We haven't broken the quinta... Quint number. Okay. Got it. 49 processes. And so one of the things that's new is the front end. Mm -hmm. When I say front end, chapters one, two, and three. Yes. Totally redone. Totally redone. A lot of the same knowledge that was in three chapters is now in two, but it's been revised. And there's a new chapter called The Role of the Project Manager. Wasn't that Appendix X1 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it was kind of like leadership four. skills. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No, now we're talking about the role of the project manager, and we actually reference the talent triangle. Okay. We talk about skills and abilities that the project manager needs, and we had never talked about that anywhere. And so that's in there, and I think it's really good information. Okay. And while we talk about these three chapters here, I just attended an agile working session that you helped facilitate And you mentioned, oh, Agile is going to be in the PMBOK guide starting in these first three chapters, and Mm -hmm. then you will continuously see it in the rest of the book Mm -hmm. in in areas as well. Tell us a little bit how Agile found its way into the PMBOK guide. Well, that's a good question. Um, So this sixth edition, rather than focus on traditional project management, if you will, is... um, Acknowledging more the full spectrum of project management practices. Mm-hmm. So some, and, and the other thing is we're starting to pull apart the idea of a project life cycle and a development approach. So the life cycle is a series of phases. Mm-hmm. And in an IT project, it might be, you know, um, requirements, design, detail, design, build, test, deploy. Okay. And in other things, uh, you might have a concept of operations and then process analysis uh, and then something else. So the phases that make up the project life cycle are part of each project. They're different for each project. But the product service or result that you're developing, that's a whole separate thing. That's kind of in the, okay, we've done our organizing, we've done our originating we haven't done our closing, but now we got to do the do. we got to build <laughs> this thing. How are we going to do it? Incrementally? Are we going to build a little piece and get feedback, then build a little bit more and get feedback? Are we going to plan it all out until we have all the requirements down to the nth degree and then implement them? 
Are we going to uh, build a little bit and deploy it, build a little bit more and deploy it? So that's the development approach, and that's where we start to talk about Agile. Agile can be a development approach. So we talk about that in the first three chapters. I think it's chapter one. And then in the start of every knowledge area from chapter four to chapter 13, we have started to codify four main things that we talk about before we hit the first process, and that is key concepts, considerations for adaptive development, and what else is it? Approaches for adaptive environment. Key concepts, trends and emerging practices, approaches. There okay, go. got it. Yeah, so those four new sections in the front of each knowledge area include key concepts, and those were really in the fifth edition, and they were scattered throughout, so we've just codified them under one section header called key concepts. And then we're also looking at trends and emerging practices. So there are things that people think should be in the ITTOs, but they aren't practiced on most projects most of the time, but they're gaining ground. So we can talk about those. We can talk about um, backlog scheduling, or we can talk about uh, how things are evolving in risk management, but they aren't necessarily baked into most projects most of the time. And then we can also talk about tailoring considerations, which I talked about. What do I need to think about when I'm going to tailor my project management plan? And then the other thing is approaches for adaptive environments. And that is how we talk about, okay, we've talked about mostly what we call plan-based predictive or waterfall development. That's PMBOK 1, 2, 3, and 4. That's right. right. And five, even five had a little bit of little talking bit. about Agile. Yes, it okay. did. Yes, it did. And so now we're saying... What do I have to think about to make the PMBOK guide fit for an adaptive project? What should I think about? One of the things might be um, I need a process for ongoing scope and discovery, or I need a process for prototyping, or I need to think about um, iterative scheduling with a backlog. Those are things with adaptive or agile type things that you're going to say, hmm, I'm not necessarily going to build my schedule the same way. I'm going to build a schedule that I'm going to build short sprints in, and I'm going to have a backlog that I'm going to progressively elaborate as I go along. So those are the four sections at the front of every section or chapter area. Okay. I think you mentioned it already, but it's important for us to, to say it again. The PIMBOK guide is not for every project, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Good practice on most projects most of the time. So it's a good practice on most projects most of the time to have a charter, right? And we think it's a pretty good idea to have a project description and maybe a business case and justification, high-level milestones. But really, maybe not for every single project. Maybe some projects don't have a charter. Maybe they call it an initial project document. Or maybe they use their statement of work that they won on, a, um, on bidding as their charter. Or they have something else. I don't know. So most projects, most of the time, doesn't mean every project every time. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see what you did. In order to develop PIMBOK 6, did you use the PIMBOK 5 framework or did you use an agile methodology? Mm -hmm. What kind of an approach have you chosen to actually develop this standard and, and the PIMBOK guide? In this edition, it was really... Um, my role was a facilitator. Okay. I had, um, I had five PhDs on my team. <laughs> everybody it's like on my herding team. cats. I was, it was, and everybody was smarter than me. So all I had to do was say, here's the guidelines, go to it. And my job really was to make sure we had a consistent voice, a, a consistent approach. So I want to make sure that somebody writing in stakeholders, she writes a certain way, and she's brilliant. She was the first... Um, doctorate in project management on the planet ever. So she's awesome and she's brilliant. She has a very conversational tone. Mm -hmm. I have another person who is brilliant, but he has a very military background, so he has a very different tone. And, oh my gosh, it would be horrible to read that thing if you read this, and then you read this, right? So you want a consistent tone. So my job was to herd the cats, set the rules, set the guidelines, facilitate them coming to um, decisions, log those decisions, and let them rip. And they did a great job. They did a really great job. All right. Well, let's go back into the book, open it up again.
Uh, you mentioned earlier on that there was a simplification that happened in the standard for the ITTOs. Mm -hmm. And then in the PIMBOK guide, there is mm -hmm. ITTO bundling. Yeah. What is yeah. that? What is that? That is... <laughs> 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 so the thing that happened between... So I've been around... I know, I remember, and believe it or not, I still have the first PIMBOK guide. You I have do. I started I with three. You start with three, which yeah. is the one that exploded it. It took it from this to like this yeah, huge thing, right? Yeah, it was right? like 100 pages to whatever. Yeah, yeah. 300, I yeah, think it was. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It just got huge, right? And so the tools and techniques keep increasing and growing and growing. Yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, they're huge. So we, one of the things we did is we developed an affinity diagram for the types of tools and techniques. Okay. So we said, let's look at all the tools and techniques. There were like 70 different ones. And we said, where do they naturally bundle? Yeah. Okay. We got a bunch of techniques about data gathering. We got a bunch of techniques around data analysis. We have some techniques on data representation. We got some on communication skills. So let's just say in this collect requirements, you have to have some data gathering. So we say data gathering. And then we list out some examples of data gathering. And they're all from the fifth edition, so your favorite data gathering technique is in there. But it's under the concept of data gathering, and so again, you have to tailor. You have to look and see, do I have to do focus groups? Do I have to do observation? Do I have to do all these different things that the fifth edition said I had to do? No, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do nominal group technique. I don't have to do questionnaires. I don't have to do anything. I have to do what makes sense for my project. And the PIMBOK guide is going to show me some examples on data analysis. I might do mind mapping. I might do document analysis. I might do something else. So we're trying to say, what's the main point here? The main point is gather some data, analyze some data, make some decisions, and show me some data representation. That's the main point. How you do it, choose it. And again, this allows the practice to go, if you want to use agile techniques, you can use agile techniques. If you want to use predictive techniques, you can use predictive techniques. Just gather some data. All right. Let's move on and let's maybe go through the PIMBOK guide. Uh, we start with project integration management. What has changed here? Okay. So in project integration, we actually have a new process. Oh, lovely. And it's called Manage Project Knowledge. So project, so knowledge, knowledge manage. management yes. is part of the new PMP exam content outline. I saw that one coming from, from yes. far, away. far away. It is yes. part of that, isn't that? Isn't yep. that great? It's in the controlling domain. Yeah. Yep. We put it in executing. What can I say? <laughs> 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 but knowledge management is knowledge management, right? So there are a group of passionate knowledge management people who wanted a whole new knowledge area. Right. And we didn't do that. Yeah. We didn't so you've that. evolved rather than... Leapt. Yeah. Yes. So we gave a, a process called Managed Project Knowledge. And one of the things I think is a key shift in the sixth edition from the fifth edition is we're really emphasizing lessons learned and they're being collected. I think we have lessons learned. So a lessons learned register is an output from Managed Project Knowledge it then becomes a project document. And so in a lot of processes, you'll see project documents updates. And in probably 20 processes, you'll see that you're updating the lessons learned register. Right. So the thought is, please don't wait till the end to yeah. try and do your lessons learned. I know that's one of the things that we ate our own dog food on. We updated our lessons to be learned register at the end of every phase, and we tried to implement changes based on that as we went through the project. So that's a big change in integration. And it's also a way of showing how Agile has made its way into there with retrospectives, lessons learned, which happen on a very, very frequent basis. That's exactly right. So that's a, that's a really good point is Agile calls it a retrospective. We're still calling it lessons learned, but that's the thing you can tailor for Agile. It, if you don't want it's lessons It's just a word. Learned, it's just a word. You're still trying to learn from the process, right? Yep. So exactly. that's a big change. The other thing is that in close project or phase, you'll start to see some of the closeout information from contracts because, and here's what I'll say, one of the things that's different in the sixth edition from the fifth is we used research. We used academic research and we used market research. We did not use opinion. Okay. So we specifically asked the question to thousands of project managers, are you accountable for closing out contracts? No. 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 They're not. No. 
procurement contracts legal. We support the closeout. We have to document information as part of closing the project or phase about that, but we don't have the authority to close a contract. Gone. A lot of people are going to cry about that, but it's right. gone. Next is scope management. So we continue to emphasize the difference between project and product scope, and a lot of the reason we did that is we really wanted to be supportive of the requirements management practice guide, but also the business analysis practice guide and business analysis is actually coming out with a foundational standard. And so it's important that business analysis is represented as part of project scope. And it's important that the PMBOK guide and the business analysis practice standard or foundational standard are talking about the same story. And so we, in the front matter of the knowledge area, we really talk about how project managers and business analysts or project management and business analysis can coexist and work together collaboratively or can be done by the same person. Not always the same thing, but always on the same side. Mm -hmm. So that's that. As far as schedule management, and you're saying, wait, no, it's time management. No, it's schedule management. That was a big thing we did, right? You cannot manage time. You cannot manage time. Time just flows. That's, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was, oh my gosh, we did battle. <laughs> we did battle on that. And we even have research. And I had to make a deal. I said, look, if 66% or more of the people say, no, they don't manage time, then it stay, and then we go to schedule. And so it's project schedule management. Yeah. Okay, and we took a process out. We took a process out, and we, but we stuck it over in resources. So estimate activity resources mm-hmm. is about the resources. It's right. not about the schedule. We need it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so we moved it over there. All right. Then we have cost management. Almost no changes. Almost Very no stable. Changes. Earned Very value stable. management is still the best and greatest thing that ever happened to project management. I don't know about that. And I don't even know if it's used on most projects most of the time. <laughs> right. But it's in there. And um, there was some desire to bring in earned schedule. And so we put earned schedule as part of the trends in emerging practices. Okay. Because it's not on most projects and it's not even on most earned value projects. But it is something that's emerging and it should be discussed. Yeah. Okay. Quality management. Oh, good. Uh, process name change. Perform quality assurance has become managing quality. To be in line with all the other processes of the same name. Yeah, yeah. We're managing it. We're, um, and we also tried to step a little bit away from a lot of the things in project quality management were more reflecting manufacturing. And we were trying to force fit them into projects. So I asked my quality lead to make this focus on project quality management. And so I think he did a good job. There's, there's a different tone there. There's a different tone there. So that happened. Now, another change to the knowledge area, to a section, is we don't have project human resource management. We have project resource management. This is the first time the PMBOK guide where we've said you have team resources, and you have physical resources. And it's just as important to manage your equipment, your supplies, your material, whether that's rebar and concrete or servers and hardware. You have to plan for that, and we weren't acknowledging that anywhere. So the way we're referring to human resources is we're calling them project team resources. Okay, that makes sense. And the way we're referring to other types of resources is physical resources. I'll tell you something funny. Uh, the first time I saw the first draft, it was human resources and non-human resources. Oh, my God. I know. And I'm like, where's the aliens? Where are the aliens? Where are the cats, right? You know, it's non-human resources. So we decide physical resources. <laughs> All right. Next is project communications management. And I, I heard a rumor that the S in that was a long discussion. Should it be communication management or communications management? Is, is that rumor right? There was a long discussion about that one letter. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Of course it would fall under communication, <laughs> right? So we were having an argument about the process managed communication. 
And the reason we were having an argument is we realized that some people were arguing about managing the act of communicating, Mm -hmm. and some people were talking about managing the artifacts from communications. Okay. So we said, got it. That's the source of the issue. So we said, communication is a process of transferring knowledge, information, and data between people. Communications are artifacts used during the communication process, like reports and presentations, meetings, emails, and so forth. So it's project communications management, and part of that is communicating effectively. Mm -hmm. Any big changes in that? No. Not really. No, not really. Which brings us to the next one. It doesn't have an S. Project (laughs) risk management. (laughs) That's right. So we were lucky enough to have the risk doctor on our team. David Hilson, yes. David Hilson, yeah. He was our risk manager. He was also my vice chair, so I was pretty fortunate there. Um, We have a new process. Do you ever wonder why we plan a lot for risk management and then we control risks. Well, but we don't actually do control. anything. We don't do anything, <laughs> yeah. right? So we said, you know, we should really s- implement risk responses. Yeah. Part of executing process groups. So there's a new process in there, implement risk responses. We changed, um, in a lot of the monitoring and controlling um, processes, we stepped back from control to monitor. You don't control people. Mm -hmm. You don't control risks. You don't control stakeholders. You don't control communications. You don't control time. Yeah. Well, some things you can control a schedule, maybe. But those things particularly, you can monitor. Yeah. So we stepped into monitor risks. We have implement risk responses, and now we monitor risks. We don't control them. We have a new response, which is escalate. That's a new response strategy. So Mm -hmm. if you have something going on in a project... And you as the PM don't have the authority to do something about it. You escalate you escalate it. it up. Exactly. Yeah. And um, there's a little bit more conversation about overall project risk. Yeah. So not just risk events, but what's the overall? The overall project risk. Yeah. Okay. Variability, ambiguity, that's kind of overall. Mm-hmm. So we start to talk about that a little bit more. Okay. You already mentioned that you learned that we project managers are not really responsible for much of what happens in project procurement management. Does that mean then that there were major changes that went into procurement management? There were major changes. Major changes. It was written long ago and far away. (laughs) (laughs) And a lot with the American government in mind, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, there it was. So we really made it a lot more international. I had a gentleman on my team uh, for a while who did a lot of the heavy lifting, and he brought a big international perspective. And so it's a lot more relevant today mm-hmm. than it was, and a lot more robust. And so, and then, but it's down to three processes: plan procurement, management, conduct procurements, and I think control procurements. Yeah, control procurements. But closed procurements, as we mentioned, is out of there. Okay. And that takes us to the stakeholder management. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So project stakeholder management is robust. I I mentioned I had the blessing to have Linda Bourne on my team, and uh, she is maybe the world's expert on stakeholder engagement. So a lot of the way we're talking about stakeholders now isn't managing them, it's engaging with them. So it's plan stakeholder engagement, manage stakeholder engagement, monitor stakeholder engagement. And... She knows so much, and I know I broke her heart because she just had so much information she could give, and we still have to keep it as a guide, so I had to trim a lot, and I think I think that's too bad because it was great information, but it is a guide, so we had to trim it. But it's great. It's, a, it's such a good chapter now. Yeah. All right. Okay, those were the 10 knowledge areas on the Pinbok Guide. When is it due? <laughs> when can we expect this wonderful <laughs> new pinball guide? Oh, so let's see. If you're an REP, a registered look for education it. provider, a registered education provider, look for it uh, December 16 or December 2016, January 2017, somewhere around there. Okay. You'll have about six months to update your materials before it hits in paper. 
um, third quarter 2017. And one of the things that's really great this time is PMI Publications is going to publish it in 12 translations all at once. So mm-hmm. it isn't like it'll come out in um, the U.S., in English, and then maybe a couple months later in French, and then maybe a couple months later in uh, Spanish or whatever, all 12 key translations will hit at the, the same time. The market at the same time. Isn't that great? Yeah. It's really awesome. So giving it to the registered education providers first is, of course, a sneaky way by PMI to make us do all the hard work. And by us, I mean... I'm a PMP trainer, therefore I am really going to look at this book and I'm going to go, okay, I need to teach this in six months' time. I have to update my training materials, have to go through it. Hey, wait a minute, there's a mistake here. Right? So we're doing all your hard work now. Isn't that great? Yeah. I know, it's such a great QC thing. (laughs) I just love it. It's fantastic. I love it. It's fantastic. There were some erratas that happened with the fifth edition and... Uh, hopefully they won't happen as much or at all with the sixth edition because the REPs and the translation teams are the ones that find the inconsistencies. Yeah. And as much as I've looked at this thing so many times, oh, and I have an awesome QC, Alejandro Romero Torres, he's an awesome QC person. We are human beings and we cannot catch them all. Yeah. So hundreds, hundreds of REPs, I'm sure, will catch them oh, all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember in the fifth edition... Uh, Verified and validated deliverables. That was, I think, the, the big change. Th- change that everybody found. It's like, wait a minute, you still got it in three, four places wrong, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that was the, the big one. And uh, it, it hit the market with those errors. So the first printed edition of the PMBOK guide was used by the students. And they were like, oh, my God, this is wrong. Which edition do I have? What do yeah. I have to study? Right. Yeah. So there was there was there was all of that. So it comes out at the end of 2016, early 2017. Mm-hmm. It will go into print quarter, third quarter, which is September to mm-hmm. October. Uh, no, that's. Uh, I'm sorry. So I misspoke. Yeah, I think the beginning of the third quarter. I'm beginning. So September. Yeah, I'm thinking August, September, maybe okay. earlier. I don't know how fast PMI can get turned around, but I know. Um, PMI uh, Publications already has it in their hot little paws, and they are working on it. So, <laughs> All right. And have you already heard anything from PMI certifications? When are they intending to then use the sixth edition as the basis for the new uh, P- updated PMP exam? I don't know. I believe, so here's what I believe to be true. I don't believe the PMP will adopt the 6th edition until 2018. Okay. But I don't know when in 2018. I don't know if it'll be January or March or June. I just don't know. Um, There is a a real need to separate standards and certification because the PMBOK isn't isn't the de facto place to go. Exactly. It is just the guide for most projects and... Yeah. Most of the time. And it is not your... It's not the only source. Exactly. Yeah. It, it is a big source for the PMP exam. It is a, it is a 100% source for the CAPM exam. Yes. But it is not the only one for right. the PMP standard. Yeah. So I don't know when they're going to update the CAPM or the PMP for that. Okay. I I know that they're aware. And one of the things I'm going to do as I close down the project is I'm going to summarize, much like the presentation I'm giving at Congress, I'll give a similar presentation to certification so they at least know what's changing. So they, um, they'll they put together their group to do the role delineation study and they'll go through their process to develop a really good exam. And I would assume that they'll also go through their existing question bank and make sure there's no questions that are referencing something that's different. Right. So okay. I'll at least let them know, but I'm not allowed to know what they... I don't know what their process is. It's secret. Nobody's allowed to know. <laughs> I know. Nobody's allowed to know. So let's look back. How was Pinbox 6 for you as the project manager? Oh, such a delight. It was such a delight. And it was a delight because I had such a great team to work with. I could so count on them. And I'll give you just an example of how well the team worked together. About a year into the process, one of our team members was diagnosed with lung cancer and stage three lung cancer. So this was not a light diagnosis. 
And we had people on the team say, I'll take this part, I'll do this, I'll do this. And we took care of it. And when he was well enough to come back, and I'm so happy to say he is well enough to come back and he's doing very well, he picked it back up. And at the end of the project, in our last meeting in Vancouver, it was like, well, we need to do some final QC. And people say, I'll take this part, I'll do that part, I'll do this part. I'll, You know, people were like, still at the end, at the finish line, they weren't exhausted. They were exhilarating and still wanting to work together and still excited to do this. So that was the best part about it, is working with this awesome group of people. All right. If you had to make a recommendation to the person who will be working on Pinbox 6 in your, uh, Pinbox 7, excuse me, in your role as project manager, what would be in the email that you send to her or him? Yeah, so I am going to in the next couple of weeks. So David has put together a lessons to be learned with like 150 lessons to be learned. And I'll be using some of that for a closeout report. But one of the things I want to do is I want to write a letter to the chair for right. the next person. I don't know what I'm going to put in that yet. But I think one of the things I'm going to say is take your time and get your team right. Because if you've got the right team, you can do anything. So I think that would be what I would tell them. And I think that applies to every project out there all the time. Good wrap-up. Good wrap-up. Right. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I, I just come up with you these nuggets. just nailed it. <laughs> all right. right. Cindy, thank you so much for telling us all about the upcoming great things for Pinbox 6. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for interviewing me.